So your bell digger said the list, some characteristics that are passed on to families, name one characteristic that is inherited, but that may also be influenced by behavior or environment. Let's see what you guys came up with. Okay, height, eye color, hair color, flexibility. And then the last one, height. Okay, yeah, like height is normally not influenced by the environment unless you're like in North Korea. Because they starved their people. For a long time, this is kind of crazy. For a long time, they thought that the South Koreans were taller than the North Koreans genetically. Turns out when you starve your people and put them in concentration camps, and you know, they don't grow. So, <laughs> so as soon as like they fed North Koreans, they found out, yeah, Koreans are Koreans, same size. Go figure, right? Yeah, I know. That's a real thing, though. Like, for years, I don't know if you guys are familiar with North Korea, but... They're a communist country. They had concentration camps. Whole nine yards. Okay. Uh, no, no. Yes. Yes. They don't have enough to feed. and. Take. So I see a lot of traits. I'm sorry. What was, there's a lot wrong with North Korea. We'll talk about that later. But uh, I see a lot of traits. Eye color, hair color. Sense of humor could be influenced by the environment. I like that one. The rolling the tongue is genetic. Attached detap, detached lobes. Um, I don't know where we're going with that. Uh, I, I know the way I am is the way I am. MM, bless you. Okay. So we understand from mitosis and meiosis that, you guys, we have a set of chromosomes, and then when we make sex cells, sperm and egg, we divide those up and separate what we have as traits or genes. We, we know we copy genes or DNA on the RNA, and we can go through that whole process, and we will again, but that's how we get our traits. So our traits are expressed proteins, like pigment. Pigments are proteins. That means I have a brown pigment. Who has a blue pigment in their eye? All right, and so if you lacked pigment, like you didn't have any protein, you'd have red eyes. That's just blood vessels you're seeing at that point, right? Isn't that kind of creepy? You're just seeing blood. Yeah. So that's what that's what the the albinoism. You know, yeah. So we're going to be talking an awful lot. Uh oh, if things work, it's not good. We're going to be talking an awful lot about traits, what it means to have dominant and recessive traits, which leads us back to this monk called Gregor Mendel. And he did conduct experiments on plants. He used peas. And we'll talk about why he used peas in his first experiments and what they meant. And we'll talk about the results of his first experiment. And I gave you some images, I believe, in your note. We'll talk more about those later in your notes. So this monk named Gregor Mundell did breeding experiments in the 1800s with garden pea plants. It is very ironic that the most controversial topic of biology, what is the most, let me ask you this question, what is the most controversial topic in biology that we're going to cover this whole year? What do you think it will be? Shutting that off, it's too noisy. Pause. Start it up later. What is the most controversial topic? We'll talk about the whole year. And really, it's not that controversial. Not in science, anyway. But it, it will be, just because of by nature what it is. Let's see what you guys came up with. So, cloning. I'm going to lock you out. We'll talk about it. Cloning's controversial. Evolution, for sure, is always the one that I tend to be in like the huge debate about with people all the time. I always want to talk about it, and I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. This is not like a happy conversation we're about to have. And evolution is controversial. And it's very funny and ironic that the data that supports evolution was discovered by a monk, Gregor Mendel. That he found, I mean, it, it is ironic, right? And so Gregor Mendel did all of this, these experiments on these pea plants and founded genetics which is the evidence that 
is used today to show and prove evolution to be not only uh, a hypothesis, but a proven hypothesis many times over, and indeed a theory, because of it, it's the fact that it's never been disproven, ever, by science. So the science of heredity and the, me and the mechanisms by which traits are passed from parents to offspring is what is called genetics. And that's what we're here to study in Chapter 12 and to get a better understanding of how we come to realize why things are different, how they become different, and how they even change over time, which indeed is evolution. Are you guys different than your mom and dad? You're evolved. It's that simple. You're different. If one generation is different than the previous, you have evolved. Don't go home and tell your parents I'm more evolved than you. They don't like that. But indeed, my children are more evolved than I am because they have changed and they're farther along in the genetic process than I am. So modern genetics is based on Mendel's explanations of, uh, for patterns of what's called heredity, and he used garden pea plants. So there are different laws of genetics. We talked about two already in meiosis, right? The law of independent assortment, and we mentioned the law of segregation. So most of Mendel's experiments involved crossing different types of pea plants. What does that mean? He had them sexually reproduce together. And in this case the, case, the word cross means to mate or breed the two individuals. So that means we're using sexual reproduction by con, con, uh, binding two different uh, DNAs together. Now, if he just cloned them, that would be asexual, but he didn't. He brought two together, like two parents. So in garden pea plants, uh, the reason he used that it's a good test subject for studying heredity because the plant has contrasting traits that usually, use my board for a minute, I'm getting some, our internet today is rough around here, I don't know what's going on. So the garden pea plant is a good subject for studying heredity because the plant has contrasting traits and usually self-pollinates and grows easily. You can even refresh your screen, that might help. I see it's worked. So. so in the study of heredity, physical features that are inherited are what are called characters. Let me explain to you what a character is. Eye color is a character. Height could be a character. Shape could be a character. Did I tell you what shape, what height, or what eye color? No. So a character is pretty general is what I'm telling you. A trait is one of the possible versions of that character. So a character for eye color could be brown or blue. So two traits. You understand the terminology? You've got to be careful about how things are worded in genetics. A character would be general. A trait would be a type of character. And the offspring of a cross between parents that have contrasting traits is what is said to be a hybrid. I'm a hybrid. I've got a blue eye gene and I've got a brown eye gene. But I have what? Brown eyes. Josh, how's notes going for you? Is it working? Do you need a writing utensil? You got one? Okay. Good deal. Okay. Just checking. Just checking. So in your notes, I believe, did I give you the images? Yes. Okay, so I, I put an image on there, and for some reason it didn't come through. I'm having some sketchy issues with my Internet today. But you should see where... You, in your notes, you have the process of artificial selection going on. So he took, what he did is he actually took and cut the male part out of a flower so that the flower could not pollinate. So it removed the pollen or the sperm from one flower. And then he would dust the pollen from one flower with a, a paintbrush and wipe that gently on the pistol uh, the female organ of the other flower, and he would pollinate it, okay? And that way he knew exactly what that flower was getting. Like artificial insemination for humans, he knew what he was going to get when he put the pollen from that flower into the stigma of the other flower. That is not natural selection, is it? That's called artificial selection. So in garden pea plants, each flower contains both male and female reproductive parts. 
This arrangement allows the plant to self-pollinate or fertilize itself. Now, it's a good thing that the pea plant can self-pollinate because sometimes there's not another pea plant around, right? And sometimes there's not a bee flying by. What if it's a really cold season? You know, no, beer, no birds and the bees don't happen. It has to have the ability to self-pollinate with its own pollen. So that means it can get its own self pregnant in a way, right? Well, here's why. If I had to explain sex to a young child, and if you're listening to the YouTube, a student asked, why do they call it the birds and the bees? They use the birds and the bees as a metaphorical simile uh, to show what sexual reproduction is. So if you don't want to get into the graphic explanation of procreation with a child, you explain it in the form of the birds come by and they pick up some information from one flower, the pollen, and they carry it over to the other, a different flower, like a female, and you're relating the two. Do you understand? And they drop the pollen off. Wouldn't it be flowers and bees then? The birds and the bees. The birds do the same thing, right? So the birds and the bees, birds can pollinate as well. Think about a little hummingbird carrying, okay? All right. Yep. So this leads into cross-pollination where you have one plant cross-pollinating with another. One, let's say we have a white with a purple, right? So cross-pollination occurs when pollen from one flower of a plant is carried by an insect or by other means to the flower of another plant, the birds and the bees. Okay. Now Mendel cross-pollinated pea plants by removing the male parts from some of the flowers and then dusting the female parts with pollen from another plant. They still do this today when they're making new varieties of flowers and trying to get trees and varieties of grapes or varieties of apples. They do this all the time. They'll dust one, pollinate another, and they'll try to create a new variant. Sometimes you can. Plants are able to actually interbreed more than like mammals. They're you can create brand new species from, and you can actually make a new species that has a whole other set of chromosomes sometimes with plants. That's more of an AP biology thing, but just know that, yes, that can happen. Like carnations, how many different color carnations can you think of? And then if I cross two, sometimes I can cross a red and a white and get a white one with red in it, right? And so this is all done by this process of, yes, sometimes it works, sometimes. Now with trees, you can take like the actual stalk of a grape plant and you can graft a tree sapling, like an apple tree sapling on it, and you get a grapeple, right? We've all heard of that. But that's not the same. We aren't playing with their genetics. That's just them drawing in nutrients a special way from their roots and making it taste different. So a monohybrid cross, you guys probably know these as a Punnett square. I didn't, did I? I'm sorry. No, I didn't, did I? Where did So where it says the garden pea plant is a good subject because it, where am I at here? Matures, Matures quickly and produces many offspring. And then where it says, thus Mendel was able to compare several results for each type of cross and collect a lot of data. And collecting repeated data is an important part of the scientific process. Nobody would believe uh, Mendel, if he just did it once, right? You'd have to repeat it. I don't know how that slide got deleted, but it did. I'll have to check that later. So in a monohybrid cross, this is one that's done to, care, to compare one pair of contrasting traits, just one, mono. One character at a time. Mono means one. So crossing a plant that has purple flowers with one that has white flowers, I'm looking at two traits, but am I looking at more than one character? No. So 
if I look at those two, and it's even though it's two traits, it's one character, it's a monohybrid cross. Now, Mendel's first experiments used monohybrid crosses and were carried out in three basic steps. Each of these steps involved a new uh, generation of plants. And when I look at a generation, we're talking about a group of offspring from a given group of parents. And we'll draw that out in just a minute from P1, F1 to F2. So plants that self-pollinate for several generations produce offspring of the same type. Such a plant is said to be a true breeding individual for a given trait. If you are a true breeder, you are a P. I have a type. I just don't worry about that. There's, don't worry about that. That's my typo. The first group of parents that are crossed in a breeding experiment are called the parental or P generation. So that means the parent generation is true breeding. And the offspring of the P generation is what is called the first filial generation or F1. So if I get two P's together, I get F1. If I get two F1 generations together, I get F2. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Mendel followed the F1 generation to self-pollinate and produce new plants. He called this offspring the second filial generation, or F2 generation. Now, it's not as simple as the way I drew it over here. Let me show you what he actually did. I'm going to have to come up on the board. So we're talking about purple and white here, basically. It's one trait he looked at. One parent was pure for purple. The other parent was pure for white. Okay? They came together to make an F1 generation. Forget about what color they are. That doesn't matter at this point. Do you suppose they only made one or many different pea plants? Many. So if I take then two of these, brother and sister, plants don't care, okay, and we inbred that F1 generation with another F1, we ended up with an F2 generation. I will tell you, because these two are different, this F1 generation right here will always be what is called a hybrid. Okay? We'll give it some more names later. It's heterozygous, but we'll, we'll step into that in a different moment. Not right yet. What? What, heterozygous? Yeah. Well, you guys, do you think we're as simple as pea plants? Do you think there's one, do you think there's one trait that controls your hair color? No. Do you think there's one trait that controls your height? No, there's not a single trait in you that's controlled by just one gene. We are complicated. Okay? Pea plants are an awesome subject because they have what are called monogenic traits, where traits are controlled by just one set of genes. We are not that simple. Even our eye color, if you have green eyes, I can't tell you anything about your mom or dad. The only thing I can tell you if you have blue eyes is I know you carry two blue eye traits, two blue eye genes, sorry. Yes. Um, you're referring to yes and no. Um, gosh, how do I put this in a nice way? So the, there was royalty, and if you were of that descent, yes, but the majority of people on planet Earth were not royalty, so that is an, an uneducated statement that somebody's made about that. So 
yeah, blue-eyed traits existed outside of the royal family. It's just they bred for them. So you could be, but the probability is against it. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, there's like a joke. That's why British people have crooked teeth and all that. But, yeah, I know. It, it, we could go on about this, but it's not a, there's no truth to it. So, yes. Everything came from brown eyes. Yes. The reason we know that is the genetic history of our own evolution as a species. All human existence stemmed from Africa, okay. which means we all would have started with dark melanin skin and dark eyes. Okay. So we can talk about that a different day when we get into evolution and all that fun stuff. But that's not even. I will tell you, that's not even controversial evolution. That's just evolution of modern man. That's not like changing into a man, you know. That's actually just our own history. That's fact. We don't even argue that. Yes. So green eyes are actually influenced by more than one gene. So they aren't rare. It's just there's different versions of them. Okay, so you can have hazel, you can have green, you can have, yes. Okay, so, oh, this is easy to answer. So your your eyes are made of a pigment, right? That's what gives them their eye color. And we all understand that a chloroplast pigment absorbs and reflects light. So we all have a little different protein. Depending on how the light hits the protein, it will refract light differently. So under different light, sometimes eyes look different colors. So all of Mendel's F1 plants express the same trait for a given character. So that puzzled him a little bit, made him think he knew something. And the contrasting traits seemed to have disappeared. So here's what he did. He bred white with purple, and he got purple. And he's like, oh, I must have gotten rid of white. That'd be like my mom and dad. My mom had blue eyes, my dad had brown eyes. She, my dad was like, oh, I got rid of blue. But then I had daughters that had what? Blue eyes. And I was like, hey, what the heck, we didn't get rid of it. We'll talk about that. So the contrasting trait, it didn't really skip. It never really went anywhere. It was just not expressed. So the contrasting trait reappeared. However, in some of the F2 plants, when the F1 were, uh, plants were allowed to self-pollinate with themselves, basically inbreed, they showed back up. So for each of the seven characters that Mendel studied, he found a similar three-to-one ratio of contrasting traits in the F2 generation. Now, I'll make sense of that for you in a minute. What he said is, I had a pure brown parent, let's say, and a pure blue parent. And they bred, and they had a child like Mr. Mason, who was big, or brown and blue. But he showed blue, brown. And let's say I had another clone of Mr. Mason, and then they got together and had a baby, if that were possible. And then their baby all of a sudden had blue eyes. Well, we must not have gotten rid of the brown, or the blue, right? It must have been there. And what he discovered was that whole dominant recessive thing. You get that? That a trait doesn't disappear. Keep in mind, he's a monk who's gardening, and he's looking at these things and writing them down. He must not have had a very social life. That's all I know. Because if you decide to start counting, like pea color and flower color and while you're gardening, you are... You're, you are a different individual, right? <laughs> Can you imagine, like, just keeping Mark? And, like, no one told him to do it. He's a monk, for crying out loud. He just, like, kept these notes. So I would, too, now. But, like, back in the day, maybe not. He might have scared me a little bit, right? So for each of the seven characteristics, you're going to find this special relationship. And I want to talk to you about this because this is, this, these are the seven traits that are monogenic. That means they're influenced by only one trait in a pea plant, which doesn't seem like a big deal until you try to find a situation in humans. It doesn't exist where you can find this because we're not monogenic organisms. We're polygenic. Now, the first one we talked about, purple and white crossbreeding, and he found that 75% of the time roughly, he would have purple. The other 25% would be white when you bred the F1 generations, okay? 
Now, the seed color in the next one, he found the same thing. He would get 75% yellow and 25% green. Round and wrinkled was another one. I'm going to give you genetics problems using these traits, okay? These characters, sorry, with the different traits. You're going to have to determine what it means to be a parental generation. It's these two. And then creating an F2 from the offspring of the parents. Let me put some expressions on these here. Let's give them some letters. So we understand dominant and recessive, correct? That's not a mystery to anybody. Brown is dominant over blue, obviously, or I would have had blue eyes. Boy, if you're doing something besides what we're doing right now, I'm about to come unglued because I do not want to reteach you because you weren't listening. You will have to do genetics problems. You won't be able to do them if you don't follow along. If I say F1, you need to know I'm talking about a hybrid. If I, if I say parental, you must know that I'm talking... Oh, I hate that. Uh, so you must know... We'll do this. It's going to mess with you, I know. This parent is dominant, dominant. This parent is... Recessive, recessive. Now, I'll always draw a line over my recessive traits because that way you know they're lowercase. Okay? So, two little piece. Why didn't I put a W here? Because we're talking about one character. That should not say trait. That chart's bad. These are different characters. These are traits, right? Okay. Now, why did I use a P? Because purple is the dominant trait. If white overpowered purple, I'd use a W. You get it? No. Listen. The next one, yellow is dominant over green. What letter am I going to use? Y. And if these are, the, these are all the parental generations here. Okay. These are the parental generations. So, this one's going to be big Y, big Y. This is going to be little Y, little Y. Yes. That's what Mendel figured out for us. Yeah, we know. I'll tell you. Sometimes I won't tell you, and I'll make you look at a chart and figure it out, but for right now, you need to just understand the basics. Yes. Yeah. 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 Over and over again. Evolution and genetics are two of the theories that have been tested the most because people have tried to disprove them the most, and it's made them the strongest ones that exist in biology because they've never been disproven, ever. That's something that not too many people will tell you. There's not one piece of scientific evidence against either one. So, scary, right? You'll find some propaganda and some made-up stuff, but you won't find real science. Yeah. Well, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking there are organizations that are, that are affiliated with that, but I'm just talking in general. You, the two don't even belong in the same room together. Like, they're two completely different things. One is a science, one is a belief, and we, they don't mix. There's, let me tell you, I have my own beliefs, and they don't even, I don't even put them in the same ballpark together. There's no reason to. The whole idea of medicine and tracking a virus as it changes and evolves and the fact that we don't die every year and we get a flu shot is evolution, right? I mean, that's what it is. So let's take a look here at what's really happening. Let's not worry about that right now. Okay. So we said that yellow is dominant over green, right? So if I take one parent who's dominant, dominant for a trait, and I take another parent who's recessive, recessive, we understand from meiosis that they don't get to give both halves of themselves, correct? What is this parent always going to give? 
always going to give a big Y. What's this parent always going to give? A little Y. The, this is the parental generation. This is the F1 generation. Do you guys understand that? The F1 generation will always be hybrid, heterozygous. Now, if I take two of these and breed them, I am going to get the F2. And that's what Mendel did. He bred these, two of these, to get that F1 generation. And that's where he saw the 3 to 1 ratio. Let me, let me just show you what that looks like. Give me one moment. So what he did is he took two of those hybrid individuals, and he said, I am going to cross them We're going to put mom here, and we're going to put dad here. And we're going to find out what possible sperm and egg they could give. Can either parent give both of them? No. They'll get to, this one gets to give a big Y or a little Y. And what I mean give is I mean in their gamete through meiosis. Remember meiosis? You only get to give half of your DNA. Half of your, you only get to give one of your pairs. Which one is the question, right? And it becomes a probability game. Hold on one second. We'll get there. So when we cross these, oops, sorry. Oh, now it's doing that. Now it's doing that thing again. There we go. When we cross these, we get some possible combinations. We end up with dominant, dominant. This is going to be, let's just grab our highlighter. Dominant, dominant is going to be yellow, right? What's dominant recessive going to be? Yellow. And so this is another one. What's little, little going to be? Green. Doesn't really look different, does it? Well, poop. You know that's green. Okay. So we see a 3 to 1 ratio of dominant to recessive. And he found out that even though the parents both were what color? Both these parents would have been yellow. They can produce green, right? which was a mystery because he thought he got rid of it, which meant there must be more involved in this whole process. Did he know about gametes? No. He knew about pollen. Did he know about DNA? No. He made these things up as he went along and tried to give them all names. So he made up this word allele, and he made up the parental and the filial generation. He made up all these terms that we now use, and put in the genetics. Hold on a second. Phone ring. Hello. May I? I'll have him call you when we're done with uh, lecture. Okay. Yep, buddy. So, now you start to understand what he was doing with each of these different characters, right? Okay. So I don't want that to be a confusing or a controversial thing or a confusing thing. Yes, question now. There is no dominant blue. You have two recessive blues. You don't have brown anything. Okay. Green eyes are polygenic. I can't answer that. The 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 dichromatic eyes. So. If a pigment never gets turned on, and you never copy DNA onto RNA, and you have, let's say, one of your eyes has a mutated cell at the very beginning of development, where that pigment, for some reason, just doesn't get expressed, or it has a mistake in it, guess what? You can have two eyes, two colored eyes. Two different colored eyes. What? Two different colors. You can have what's called codominance, where you get two dominant traits, blood types like that. Anybody ever heard of A type AB blood? That's both being made at the same time. 
which leads into hazel, green, and all, you know, then you start getting into all the different colors. We don't need to worry about that. We're going to keep it real simple with complete or incomplete dominance. So modern genetics is based on Mendel's explanations for the patterns of heredity that he studied in garden pea plants. The garden pea plant is a good subject for studying heredity because the plant has contrasting traits, usually self-pollinates, and grows easily. And remember that Mendel's first experiments used monohybrid crosses and were carried out in three basic steps. Yep. And don't forget, when you cross two F1 generations, you get the three to one ratio called the F2 generation. Keep in mind that you don't always get, you're not going to have four different individuals. That's the possibility for each child. Okay. All right. I want you today to work on the vocab for the rest of the hour. We're going to be doing some genetics tomorrow, okay? So there's no, I know, there's no real homework per se.